Welcome everybody. My name is Rania Kelly. I'm co-chair at Mass Families. Um, I want to thank you all for coming here today. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Ark of Massachusetts and the DD Council. We're here today to celebrate Black History Month and the title of our call today is Embracing Intersectionality, a conversation about race and disability. This is a all black moderator group and an all black panelist group. And in fact, I'm gonna stop talking in about a minute and it will disappear. Um, they came up with all the questions that they're gonna be answering tonight. It's gonna be a wonderful conversation um, and I hope you enjoy it. And there will be a answer and question um, section at the end where you can all come off camera and unmute. So we're gonna start off with the land acknowledgement. Mass Families resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the people of Massachusetts people. Um, please go to the next slide. And we're gonna start off with introducing our moderators. There's Felicia Burdett, pronouns she, her. She's the Health and Disability Linkage Coordinator at DPH. Um, Javon, I'm so sorry, I forgot how to pronounce your last name. Can you help me with that? Okundaye. Okundaye. He goes by he, him pronouns. He's an author, he's a self advocate, and he's a Massachusetts Advocates for Children fellow. Um, there's Leah Sims Okundaye, pronouns she, her, and she is a sibling as well as a mental health advocate. Next slide, please. Felicia. Um. Uh, well, I'll introduce this. Is, so Javon is going to go ahead and read something he wrote about the similarity between racism and ableism. Hey, this is a blog post I wrote as part of my job as the Racial Equity and Access Program Assistant at Massachusetts Advocates for Children. Um, the titles, The Similarity Between Racism and Ableism, I think it connects to our theme of embracing intersectionality. People have been saying that there are two pandemics plaguing society, coronavirus and racism. Being a person of color with a disability, I have dealt with two pandemics my whole life. As a black autistic man, I contend with the pandemics of racism and ableism on a daily basis. Racism and ableism are pandemics because they affect many parts of people's lives and are detrimental to people's health and well-being. Um, so what is racism and how does it affect me? Racism is prejudiced and discriminatory attitudes and actions toward people based on their racial identity. As a black man, I combat many negative stereotypes about African Americans, such as that black people are uncultured and aggressive. These beliefs make me feel that I am inferior to white people and have to work twice as hard to succeed in life. Um, yeah, to go to the next one. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. What is ableism? How does it affect me? Ableism is prejudice and discriminatory attitudes and actions toward people because they have a disability. As an autistic man, I struggle against the stigma of having a disability. That says that people with disabilities are unfit for society and people with autism lack empathy. These judgments make me believe that I am inferior to people without disabilities. Okay, here we go. Okay. As a person on the autism spectrum, I sometimes feel the need to defend my diagnosis by saying that I have lower support needs or am higher functioning, but this disparages those with higher support needs or considered to have lower functioning autism. This notion of functionality levels refers to an autistic person's ability to modify their behavior and adapt to the norms of a society that is not built for us. Um, how are racism and ableism connected? Racism and ableism go hand in hand in many ways. For instance, a smaller percentage of Black and Latinx people are diagnosed with autism than their white counterparts. This means that autistic students of color are less likely to get proper individualized education programs, IEPs, that fit their needs. Even when autistic students of color get diagnosed, they are more likely to be placed in separate special education classrooms rather than general education ones. This results in these students not learning in the least restrictive environment. Also, racial profiling results in Blacks being stopped by police officers at a higher rate than whites. Since cops see race before disability, they might perceive stimming and lack of eye contact as threats. If I'm ever stopped by the police, 
I would be scared. In my wallet, I carry an autism card that describes my condition, but if I pull it out in a panic, the police might think I'm reaching for a weapon, which may have dire consequences for me. So that's the end of my blog post. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I wanted to go ahead and introduce our panelists for this evening. We have Giasi Burks Abbott, who's um, one of our panelists this evening. We have Fredosa Hassan. We have Lisa Antoine. We have Lisa A. Sims and Paloma Fernand. I'm sorry, Pal uh, my Paloma Fernandez. Fernandez. Um, who will be our panelists this evening? So we are going to go through a set of discussion, um, a set of questions, and just have an open discussion, an open dialogue on um, our feelings and our thoughts um, regarding the questions that the team has put together. Um, so the first question for this evening is: Question number one is: um, Do you see similarities between being a person of color? and being disabled. Um, anyone can feel free to respond as you see fit. I guess I will go. This is uh, Jossie uh, Burks Abbott. And I think uh, Javon covered a lot of the intersectionality between being a person of color, being black and, and being autistic. I mean, he talked about, for instance, interactions with the police which actually can affect people with disabilities and affect um, people of color separately. And also, of course, if it's combined, mm -hmm. he mentioned about having to work twice as hard to prove you're competent. He mentioned that, you know, and he mentioned some of the stereotypes of incompetence, you know, lack of empathy, lack of intelligence. But as I have uh, come to learn more about the disability rights movement, I have found some very interesting parallels between that and the civil rights movement. Like I'm very intrigued, for instance, by during the oral arguments for the uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, one of the lawyers from uh, South Carolina who was arguing to maintain segregation said, well, if we let black people and white people go to school together, the next thing you know, mentally retarded people would go to school. And then of course, there's the example of um, with the sit-in, the 504, section 504 sit-in in 1977 in San Francisco, when a Judy, Judy Human and other advocates were assisted, got le le logistical support from the Black Panthers uh, because they basically saw common ground. And of course, actually, that was actually, actually that was instigated by Brad Lomax, who was a member of Black Panthers. And he was also, he was a Black self-advocate. I think he had multiple sclerosis. So, would anyone else like to add to the conversation? Yeah, this is for Dosa Hassan. I am um, hundred percent agree with Javon and uh, Gazi for for their comments about this issue. And what I see the similarities, almost similar to everybody else, is that they are both groups: the um, people of people of color and the disability. They're both seem that they have to work harder and they're ignored and they're not given the attention that they deserve. So everywhere you go, you're asking for an IEP meeting or you're asking for an, a services for your child. And, and I feel like it's just, the intention is just to make it harder for you. And as a person of color, you just seem like you wanna, um, you want people to understand where you're coming from, but it doesn't seem that it's that easy. So you have to work harder and, um, and just uh, get try to get that attention that you're not getting and the attention that you deserve on your child might deserve as well. So that's what I feel. Um, I'll go next, it's Paloma. Um, I agree again with everybody's been saying, but I'm gonna take it a little bit um, higher. I don't, I feel like it's fighting. We're always constantly fighting to just be seen um, whether it's because we're a person of color and whether we have a disability. So if you have both, we're constantly fighting, fighting to be seen and understood and heard, then fighting to be acknowledged that we have value, our intelligence or whatever it might be. Um, and it's just always a fight. 
so it's shorter but <laughs> that's how i that's how i see it so what i was saying is that i agreed with um paloma in so far as always being you know we always have to fight we have to fight for our rights we have to fight for um to be understood we also have to fight for equality when it comes to um disability rights and we have to fight for access it's very limited access for us because any resources that are available are held very closely to the chest. Most people are not willing to share because they don't have that empathy for anyone of color who is disabled. My name is Lisa A. Semden. Um, when I you know, think about that question, one of the things I think of is that I have two things going against me my race and disability. And my disability is invisible. Um, I should have started off by saying I had a stroke. So if I confuse you too much, I'm sorry about that. But it, it makes it hard because when you have a disability that's invisible, people aren't uh you know ready to accept like if you talk slower because of you know you're trying to get your words and thoughts together and that's invisible but my race as you as you can see is not invisible so I, I just think that I live, you know, with two things going against me just to fit into society. And it, it just, it's really hard. Um, and I hope, like I said, I hope I didn't confuse you too much, but that's what I see. Now, the next question is, can you speak to the implicit bias you experience when it comes to disability and being a person of color? And this question's for the panelists. So Hassan again. Bias treatment is everywhere that I go. And I am not only Black, I'm an immigrant as well. And I'm Muslim. So these are three things that usually um build barriers and obstacles so everywhere you, i go bias treatment is becoming a norm and it's just like um it makes you feel like you're not um entitled to uh things that you need because uh, especially when i go to the uh school meetings or places that i need to get services for my daughter i have a 17 year old daughter who's autistic and she has a intellectual disability as well. So it seems like they're intentionally making me confused, trying to confuse me with all their words and all their uh, you know, vocabularies and this and that, because the assumption is, of course, you're a foreigner, you're an immigrant, you don't, know, you don't understand what, where, what's happening. And therefore you don't, even if I, um, you have to, uh, fight for it, you have to struggle with it, and you're always um, not not welcome. You're n how many of us are on the table? None. How many Muslims are you seeing in meetings and in uh, presentations or conferences, and a Black person wearing a hijab or a scarf? There are not many of us available, so we're never on the table. And I'm really, really grateful for uh, Rania to give me an opportunity just to be heard. I might not be saying something useful, but I'm just, my voice is being heard. And that's just really an, um, a gift. And, and I'm grateful for Rania and Mass families for just giving us, allowing us to be present, allowing us to give the space, uh, that space that we are matter, our voices matter and we're important. So that's what, how I feel like um, Black and, and disability, it seems like they're both go hand in hand and we're never on the table. So I'm just grateful for 
Rani and Mass families for allowing us to be here. Thank you. I can go next. Um, it's the same thing as um, Dora was saying, it's just not feeling included. And if you're included, you feel like you're there because you're checking a box. So like you can, you know, if you're checking the color box and like you're here and we're gonna listen to your suggestions. And we're gonna do everything that, you know, you're talking about and then it just gaze you over. And you no, know, you were just here to check a box basically. And so it's just, you, it's again, it's that constant fight. You're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're hoping things go somewhere. And it's just, no, oh, it was, you were just kind of here to be quiet. No, you wasn't actually supposed to be doing anything. Um, <laughs> and then the disability, um, it's the same thing. You just, it, it goes back to not feeling heard. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. I didn't go get my master's because I, I had straight A's because of my anxiety. Uh, so I, I did very well. But once I wanted to go for my master's, what I was told is, well, you must not be as smart as you thought you were. And that was the end of my master's. And that was my the bias for my color, you know. Um, and then it took me forever to even get an appointment with a doctor. I had I was diagnosed with ADHD after I had my first child. So even that, because people would just say that, no, no, there's nothing wrong with you. You've got good grades. Having a mental, um, a cognitive disability doesn't mean you're dumb. <laughs> That's not what it means. It just means you think differently, you have different abilities. Um, but it was like, because they were always telling me, no, you can't have that because you have, you're on an honor roll, you're in a Dean's list. Um, needless to say, I never got my master's, but that's the similarities. It's, it's, it goes back to being heard, being seen, being understood, being valued. And um, I, I can identify with you because I have cognitive issues and the thing about it is when, like, I, I know what I want to say. It just takes me a little longer to say it. And, you know, people in general, everything is like quick, 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 quick. So if you talk a little slower, people automatically consider that as being like some kind of a deficit. So they don't have time. They think like, you don't know what you're talking about. So you put that together with a skin tone and before you even know it, they already have this preconceived notion. So I always feel like when you know, for whatever reason, a lot of the tables that I end up on, I I don't see a lot of me on around on the table. So I always feel like I have to over play my part because you don't have that, you know, um, other people to kind of like feel the camaraderie with. And my language is usually different from the people that I'm sitting with. And you kind of get that sense of, they don't understand what you're talking about. So like, I forget what, I think it was, was it Fidoso or Alicia? I don't know which one um, said that I, it really, feels good to be sitting here, being able to just be myself talking and feeling like I'm being heard and understood and stuff like that. And again, I guess this goes to thanking Rania and Mass Families for giving us this platform to feel like this because a lot of times, you know, I'm in places where, you know, uh, I do a lot of play acting 
And um, just to kind of fit in or to be accepted. But when you can be around people who, you know, understand, you know, disabilities and, you know, uh, you know, the race things and stuff, being yourself is like, wow, I, I can actually sit here and relax. And I, I'm sorry if I'm going off track, but you don't know how beautiful this feels to me right now because a lot of times I'm sitting in places where I, I feel like I, I have to, you know, I can't relax. I can't be myself. Oh, being myself, that's a no-no, you know. So I just want to thank everybody, even for just listening to me, probably rambling off, but I just feel so good. It's it's like, it's, it's a beautiful feeling to actually be able to talk and just talk freely and talk like I talk and want to talk. So... That's what I'm going to say. I guess I'll stop right now. Thank you, Lisa. I think it's just freeing. That's what it is. It's freeing. And yes. We yes. love hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love talk. I, I like being heard, you know. <laughs> Other times I don't feel like I'm heard. Well, Lisa, you've actually brought us to our next question, which I'm really looking forward to now because of what you just said. So let me just quickly, at least for myself, dispatch with this question about implicit bias with race and disability and just say that when I think of the question, I sometimes think of why I was diagnosed um, so late as autistic at 17, even though I was pretty much recognized to have some sort of disability all my life and I think a lot I mean a lot of it has to do with the science changing and the view of autism changing but a lot of it also has to do with the way I was often read I mean even though it was acknowledged that I probably had a learning disability I wasn't special ed for part of my education a lot of time my behavior was read differently you know I think of the fifth grade um, um, science teacher who wrote across the top of my paper a mind is a terrible thing to waste, which was then the United, the slogan of United Negro College Fund. I mean, I think it's interesting that since then, I think they've changed the slogan. I think now it's a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. And I wonder if they did it for that reason, because I can imagine, you know, let's take a time machine back 40 years and my fifth grade science teacher writing that across the top of my paper. She might have had to think, wait a second, I have something to do with this too. It's not all him. In other words, he, he can't waste his mind, but I need to invest in it. But anyway, having said that, I think in terms of implicit bias, I think one of the things systemically we need to think about is why people of, of color are diagnosed late and women. And I think a part of it has to do with the fact that behaviors aren't read the same when, when different people perform them. So for instance, when a woman does something that's autistic, it's not read as autistic. Or when a, a, man, a black person does something that's autistic, it's not read that way. And I mean, I you know, so I guess I would say that's definitely part of implicit bias because presumably doctors don't wanna get it wrong. They don't want it, so why do they keep getting it wrong? Probably because what's the block there? The block is probably some thing that they're really not aware of because implicit bias implies you're not really aware of it. It's just an automatic assumption. So that's that's what I would say about that. I, I agree. Um, I just want to say a little bit more about that. I just it's definitely if a, a black um boy has this same those behaviors, it's most likely use um words as defiant, use words as uh, resisting, use words as um unwilling, which is if you listen to those words, they're all arresting words but those are the words being used. But if it's a child that's a different color, then, oh no, it's just struggling. It's high, you're having a hard time. There must be something wrong. It's just really frustrating.
I don't know if anybody wants to go next or has anything else to add. Code switching. Code switching is when a member of an underrepresented group consciously or unconsciously adjusts their language, behavior, and appearance to survive in the dominant culture. I will be reading a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dog strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. What is it like to code switch for you around disability and race? Um, I guess I can go first. Um, code switching is exhausting. <laughs> um, I was having to, and, and I speak six languages and I'm around a different, a bunch of different cultures. So my code switching is a lot. I have to code switch between English and different language, white, black, disabled, able. I have to make sure that I'm saying the correct words, that I'm not over talking. It's just mentally, physically, emotionally exhausting. So not having to code switch over here, even though I'm very anxious, feels great. <laughs> just being able to talk and not having to double check myself and think about it and worry about, oops, what did I say? Did, did that sound okay? It, and just, just being able to speak, like Lisa was saying, is just freeing. So for me, code switching is exhausting and it could be, well, no, it can't be, it is. You could very well lose who you are and your your sense of self because at the end of the day you have to come home and it's like wait how many people am i i actually drew something about that about a, a girl looking in a mirror with no face and a bunch of masks to pick from and down to the eyelash and the eyebrow and smile and whatever she has to do to fit in wherever she needs to fit in and to be accepted and that's the same with color and disability that that's all i have to say <laughs> and you said a lot cuz um cold imagine cold switching for me the person with who had a stroke and whose memory has memory issues and stuff so um just for a few seconds i try to draw you into my world. I I won't even remember what's what I said after this. So you know I live in the present. So when I'm sitting somewhere, if I have to act a certain way because I'm with certain people, that takes away from the ability I have to keep up with what's really going on because I only see and can do what's in front of me. So a lot of times I forget to code switch and you get what I am because it takes a lot of work even to be who I am. So if I have to adjust to this person, you know, like um, Paloma said, losing yourself. I can easily lose myself. So for me, I decided it's best for me to, you get what you get. And if I have to apologize later, because you tell me, you know, I said something, that's it. But I am who I am, and the way my brain works, I know what code switching is, but 
But like Paloma said, it can be exhausting. I had to kind of like, you know, uh, not, you know, get into that role as hard as I could be. Because I noticed that is too exhausting for my brain and for me to just be myself is, you know, what I'm going to have to do. But like I said before, knowing that I'm sitting here with people who look like me, I, I don't, you know, I don't worry about it. But I'm going to tell you, uh, being honest, that I'm always wondering how others who don't look like me perceive me because I can't code switch, you know. So, you know, somebody else can join in and talk because I, I know, you know, how. No, I, I totally, I totally agree. I identify with that feeling like you don't need to code switch. I mean, I really didn't realize the extent to which I code switched. Um, and maybe it's because I, well, I mean, I could think back to times, for instance, in which I've held back, which I really didn't say what I thought, or in terms of race, for instance, I won't often bring up race, even if I think race is a factor, because I don't want to look like I'm always bringing up race, even right. though I never bring up race, but, or I think about code switching in terms of disability, it's like, you know, I won't often admit my vulnerabilities, especially like with this small talk, you know, if someone says, how are things? I'll just say everything is fine. Even if it's not, that's the right way to do it. But it's always interesting when there are opportunities when you can be honest and when you can say your opinion. Right. And, and you can really say what you're thinking and, and not have to pretend. And that is, that is relieving and it actually feels more honest, more authentic. And it actually uh, helps, it helps you express yourself better. I mean, even when I try to write, it's like, um, if I'm trying to say, if I'm trying, if I don't just say what I'm really thinking, but trying to say something else, it, it just interferes, you know, it's, uh, yeah. You know. see, and that's I what I call play acting. Mm. Yep. I agree with everything that's said so far. And I also just wanted to add that to me, it feels like we have a heightened sense of awareness insofar as we have to practice to pause. We have to choose our words. We have to be really, really thoughtful and methodical with what we say, where we say it, and the intent of what we say, because we don't want to be labeled or misunderstood. It's almost like a heightened sense of hypervigilance as well, where you are like a chameleon. You have to blend in and adapt to every environment that you're in just to be heard. It's exhausting and you lose yourself in the process. Yeah, and, and Lee, you said pause and I'm not really good at pausing with my ADHD. I just keep going. And then I'm, right. I'm perceived as rude and disrespectful. I'm like, uh, wait, <laughs> was I supposed to pause? I, right. I have run on sentences that come out of my mouth. <laughs> and that's, you know, and that's one of the biggest issues as well, because for other people, who are not aware of that, they might say, oh, you, you didn't let me get a word in. But for you, you have to get the word out, right? Because right. in that moment, it's what you have to say. So that's, that's what I was saying in practicing the pause, because you have to sit back and say to yourself, am I communicating effectively? Is what I'm going to say actually coming out the way it's mm -hmm. going to be said? Am I going to pre be perceived as less than if I don't construct this sentence in a certain way, if I don't say it with a certain way in a certain tone. And that in itself, as I was saying, is, is exhausting because when you get back with your peers, you are looked at differently because the system has forced you to adapt to someone who you really are not. It's a survival mechanism when we code switch because we've been in situations before where we're looked at differently based on the things that we've said. 
So now we have to practice the pause, construct these sentences, and really take some time to get that message out. Yeah, and then I, I worry that I will forget because there's a thought there, and if I don't get it out, it's just going to be gone. <laughs> right. You, you, yeah, Paloma, I think one of, the, one of the most ironic things about that is when you speak to someone, let's say on the phone, and they actually meet you in person, mm. it's like, in my case, like shock, horror, and disbelief because they assume that I'm white. Yeah. And when you meet you in person, you know, there's this awkward silence. And I look at them and they look at me and I'm like, well, here we are, what are we gonna do here? So it's a situation where even if with the best of intentions, you need to be prepared for the interaction that you would receive, which is sometimes not necessarily positive, but that's part of code switching as well. When, when you get into talking about code switching, this could go on forever and ever and ever because I, I'm absolutely quite sure absolutely everybody knows or can tell you uh, for instance what happened one day when you had to code switch or you wish you didn't code switch at the moment, you know, because it is like you said, you have to really be on your toes, you know. Who, who am I going to be? How am I going to dress? You know, so the code switching is a whole, like, you know, set of things. You know, you go to work, and if you work a certain place, you, you're code switching the way you dress because you can't dress the way you normally dress at home because it's not accepted. So, right. well, there, well, there I think you're talking about maybe the healthy aspect of code switching, where mm -hmm. I mean, code switching is to a certain extent normal. It's normal to not be the same person you are in all places, but it can get, get problematic if that's all you do, if you could never mm -hmm. be an authentic self. And never well, really for me, I am who I am because <laughs> if I, you know, uh, that that's why you probably uh, people who see me get what they get because it's it's hard, you know, it's hard, and you know, with the memory problems and all this kind of stuff. So it's like I know, but I can't always do what I know. So I know how exhausting. It things like that can be so. I agree with that. I agree. It's like a presentation issue as well, because right. apart from the code switching, you need to conduct yourself like a certain way. Yes. And you need to package yourself a certain way to be heard, even in so far as like advocating. Let's say like in a school setting, you have an IEP meeting. You know, you can't you can't sit there and be perceived as that angry black woman. Or that, it, you, know, you know, with je with jeans and a hoodie on, right? Even though, right? Or that, that's you know, my, that's what I feel most comfortable in, you know. Right. But in that moment, you know, again, we have to practice the pause and think about, yes. you know, what what are we going to do here? What environment are we in? Which role are we going to play? Am I just going to sit there and just listen and take notes? Or am I just going to ask these questions? And if I'm asking questions, how am I going to phrase these questions? I don't yeah. want to come off as defiant and argumentative and confrontational. So I'm just going to sit there and sometimes just, you know, be upset because, again, I don't have the tools or I don't have, you know, the ability to code switch in that moment because I'm in my emotions. So you would just sit there and be quiet. I do want to say something about the the clothing because I yeah. I just thought of it because you know we're talking. I think it's funny because where I live, um, we attend a lot of meetings for schools for, um, like the town. We're very involved, and by now, people know who I am. Um, I stopped code switching clothes wise. I go out comfortably with all my fidgets and whoever doesn't like it can just walk out because <laughs> that's right. what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> and they know 
that if I'm walking, I'm either knitting in the back, I'm either, and I'm close to the outside, the, the exit, I have a fidget for everything, for however I feel, and everybody in town know that, hey, Paloma's here, because I'm not, I, that's why I, it's too exhausting. <laughs> I'm already doing that with language. So, I mean, obviously yeah. I'm not going to go with ripped jeans and stuff like that, but I'm not going to be over thinking what I'm wearing. I'm not. And I'm bringing my fidgets. I have a fidget bag. I'm bringing it with me. They know by now if they don't like it, like I said, that's too bad. <laughs> right. Well, in Good your case, you. I mean, that is just acceptance, right? They've accepted you, you know, yeah. for who you are and they've accepted you with everything that comes with you and being in your presence. But for some people, as we know, you know, we just can't show up as your authentic self. No. And that's the problem. Yeah. And that is the problem. And and it was really hard to get here because it was really anxiety provoking for me to do mm -hmm. that. And I had people looking at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is what it is. But I had to do that over and over and over and over again till they're like, I've, that is what it is. But I had to be willing to do that. And that in itself was exhausting. <laughs> Well, that's why I commend I mean, you, which I didn't stop, you know, you kept coming and coming. So like, like I said, this is who I am, take it or leave it, you know, and once, you know, fidgeting or whatever you have to do, if they listen to you, you know, what you, you're talking powerful stuff and because you keep coming and keep coming and keep coming, they know she's going to still be here. So we got to accept it for what it is. And I, I just commend you for that. Cause you know, it takes, it takes a strong, strong person to do that, you know, or an exhausted Absolutely. person. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah but you I know, adapted. I know. A strong exhausted, exhausted person. Yes, you're right. <laughs> exhausted, but I'm just saying, you yeah. know, like, I Thank don't know you. if you were at the uh, meet. Yeah, you were there on Monday. Mm -hmm. I had my little meltdown, but I'm back. You know what I'm saying? Because it happens, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're all you entitled to them. Taught me, you actually taught me something. You taught me that Obama code switches. See, I didn't. Yeah. Because <laughs> oh, yes. I, one thing I always looked up to Obama for was that it seemed to me that he didn't code switch. And my example was the fact that he admits that he loves basketball. And even makes part of his politics before every election, he plays a game of basketball for good luck. In other words, he doesn't care if that's a black stereotype and he's the first black president. He loves to play basketball. He's going to play basketball. I thought not a code switcher, but I guess he does code switch. <laughs> you know, he, he dabs. I mean, I guess he does a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we it, have to go switch on both sides. You know, when we go back to our families and we just have to make sure we don't and this is the word that they use, talk white. Uh, we have to, to be who we are, which by that time, who the heck are we? So it, it goes both ways. Definitely, because adapting to, to the environments, to the many environments that we're in, that we, what we have to adapt, leaves you empty. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, again, you don't know what else to do. You're a chameleon. You can only adapt so many times. And this is when people say, like, I feel so disconnected from me. I don't know you. Like, who, you know, who are you? Who are you in this moment? Who are you in this situation? You know, who am I really talking to? Where's the real person? But again, that's, I mean, insofar as a need for it, we've actually seen it on both sides. We've seen it, you mm -hmm. know, in a negative, um, negative aspect when it's not done. And we've seen it in a positive aspect where it's the only thing that we had to do to advocate and to, to be heard. For me, code switching never comes to my mind because I am completely, I look different, I dress differently. And that's something that I don't even try because uh, I feel like, as Lisa said, this is how, who I am, this is how I am, this is how I dress. So take it or leave it. And who am I trying to please? I'm just trying to please myself and just, grab whatever I can from outside, but not try to please anybody and change or try to speak differently or I, I can eliminate my accent. I cannot, I'm not gonna remove my scarf because of somebody. It's just, this is who I am. 
So whether you like it or not, this is who I am and that's how uh, it's gonna be like. So take it or leave it. Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Does anyone have any other comments? Um, we can go into the question and answer and open it up to, unless I don't wanna cut any of you off. Does anyone have anything else to say? Maybe something we didn't discuss, any of the questions, any final thoughts? Oh, for the panelists, any final thoughts that you want to tell the group before we um, go into questions and answers? Sorry, I wasn't clear. I just want to say um, to the panelists and the moderators, thanks. You know, this was a, a really, really beautiful thing to sit and talk and be heard and actually feel like I'm included, you know? So, you know, I just want to say thanks. And thank you, Rania, for giving us an opportunity to get together and do this, you know? Thanks, Bill, <laughs> for putting it all together. So now, Rania, if you want to open it up, I guess you can. Sure, I just want to make sure no one else needs to say anything. And you know what? Lisa, you all gave me a gift. I feel so privileged to have gone through this journey with all of you, but I want to make sure no one else has any final things to say before we open it up. Panelists, you don't have to say anything else. I just want to make sure. <laughs> okay, Bill, if you can take over and start taking people's questions and, and, and get us through this. <laughs> sure, I'll do my best. So, um... Sharon, I see your hand up and uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and... Do we want to share screen or do we want to still be on the slideshow? Um, I can, there you go. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. I am forever grateful. I oftentimes feel like I'm holding my breath because yes. I can't be fully who I am or express myself without first apologizing because the last thing I would want to do is offend anyone and I don't want to be heard as somebody with malicious intent and so in saying that um, I suffer from PTSD uh, depression and anxiety and I believe I have a learning disability as well, and I haven't been diagnosed. Um, and with all those things being said, I also would like to say, you know, as an African American, um, sometimes I feel like I'm walking a fine line because there are a lot of other groups who are not African American and don't identify themselves as Black American. And so some of, I can be wrong, but some of my experiences are different. Um, and I think part of that is because, you know, I don't have the history of where I came from. Um, that is solely based on um, word of mouth and now the DNA where it gives me some specifics. And, um, that being said, uh, you know, when my mother came to this country and had her children, we weren't allowed to speak in our native language. And so I'm not um, bilingual. Um, I come from a generation where, you know, I'm coming off the heels of the civil rights movement. And so as a kid, and I don't remember, but I do um, recall the time just based on history that, and, and some things I do remember where, you know, people were being hosed or our communities were being policed and, and these kinds of things. And I would imagine that's where my trauma started. Um, and I don't think that there's been any real reprieve moving to speed. Um, you know, because of COVID, I don't get out as much, but when I did, on my way to work on a daily basis, I see memorials every day with children and family and friends who have lost their children. And this is treated like a social norm is what I call it. And so, you know, for an example, I, 
hid my anxiety and depression and PTSD as much as I could from places that I need to like work, like friends, like family, like people who would tell me like, just get over it, like move past it, that kind of thing. And as a black woman, you know, statistic dictates that a lot of these ills will be a part of my life and they have been. Um, from, you know, the social traumas to, you know, like a lot of us living in poverty and um, the things that would happen as a result of that, moving to speed. I'm a cancer survivor. I have brothers and sisters who've been murdered or, you know, are no longer here due to trauma one way or another. And so when I um, utilize, for example, uh, the resources that are provided by my employer um, to help me get the supports that I needed, even though I don't get diagnosed with things like a learning disability that I know I have. Um, I sit in meetings and I have just recently where people make light of those of us who have PTSD or, or I'll say it this way, disabilities that they don't see because I come from a community, if you will, where I do have to code switch if that's what it was. So I have to carry myself a certain way. I have to present myself a certain way. I have to speak a certain way so that it covers all the pains that I've experienced and I walk with every day. And so when I share that I have these disabilities or disability, um, it's not believed. Even my doctor didn't believe it. It wasn't until the Black Matters, the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, that was felt around the world happened that my doctor apologized to me, saying that, you know, although we're both the skin, same skin tone, her experience is different than mine. And she apologized because I felt like I was always fighting to be heard, to be Karen, seen. I, I don't mean to cut you off. We just want to be time sensitive and people are putting questions. Did you have a question or is that everything you want? I just wanted to be able to say that because okay. it's, I, I haven't had a forum where I've been able to say exactly that and just exhale in a safe place. Well, thank you so. for sharing. I think a lot of people, are, thank you. I just put my... Um, email in the chat so we can connect and maybe create other opportunities for you. Um, Bill, who's I next? See a hand, I see a hand up. All right, well, actually, um, before we get to Manel, there's a question that's on the chat um, from Julie, which says, how can white and neurotypical people make sure that our presence doesn't make you feel uncomfortable um, or that you can be your, that you cannot be yourself? I guess the question is, how do us as white people, neurotypical people, um, I'll help people make people feel comfortable for exactly who they are. Not sure um, that question. I, I can I can talk about that for a little bit. Um, just be aware of yourself. Mm -hmm. I would. That's what I'm. Be aware of yourself and your own biases. We all have biases. Even me. You know, like we grew up here and grew up with biases. Just be aware of them. And if somebody says, hey, you're kind of doing that, be welcome the feedback. Um, just that's what I just tell people. I kind of, I always introduce myself. Hey, um, this is my name and I have ADHD. This is how I am. Let me know if I'm interrupting or if you want to kind of, like I set the tone from the beginning. Um, and if somebody that's neurotypical goes, Oh, okay, cool. Let me know if I'm being this and this and we can kind of communicate. Just be try to be open as much as you can and say this is, you know, this is truly a safe space. Uh, you can speak or and it, 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 there's no such thing as perfection. It's just the willingness to be open and to understand yourself is huge. Even just posing that question is huge. So thank you. Absolutely. I agree with that too. And I also wanted to add um, to be empathetic, but not sympathetic. I think for a lot of people, you know, the sympathy that we receive, you know, on the receiving end, you know, oh my God, this must be, you know, so hard for you. 
you know, and it, it takes away from the strengths. You know, there's a lot of people with disabilities that are not necessarily seen. Those are the invisible disabilities. And the response that most people get once they find out is, wow, I, I had no idea, like, you know, what, what is this like? So be more empathetic versus being sympathetic and understand that everyone that you encounter, whether they decided to disclose or not, could potentially be that way. So just mm -hmm. be more receptive to listen and to be kind. Well said. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's all good stuff. I mean, uh, I guess I'll also say don't don't make assumptions. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think Plona has said about you know knowing yourself, self knowledge is important. But uh, there's also a way in which the best way to be an ally is just to treat people with disabilities and people of color as you would treat anyone else. Mm -hmm. Equal, yeah, equality. Mm -hmm. We have another question um, with uh, Manel with their hand up. Manel, would you like to take the floor? Thank you. Um, I don't ha really have a question, but I do have a comment to make, and I will keep it brief. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to Mass Families and thank you to the panel for putting this event uh, together. I think we need more of it. Uh, for those who yes, don't know me, do. my, my name is Manel Desvalens. Uh, I am the family partnership coordinator at Mass Rehab. And what I wanted to say is that uh, if we're, when we're talking about race and disability, we can't ignore law enforcement in that. As we know, a lot of individuals with disabilities are in the justice system where they should be at home or receiving the services that they need. And I think law enforcement play, uh, plays a key role in that when we have uh, a black a youth with anxiety or with autism or unable to look people in the eye due to their disabilities and officers may see that as a threat or an individual who is hard of hearing walking away from an officer not you know unable to hear and officers will see that as a threat and I think I don't hear enough when people are talking about police reform and I don't hear enough about educating uh, law enforcement and the uh, justice system about a, a different approach to that, at least have the understanding of that. And I also believe that the more we do this, I think it contributes to the disability movement as a whole. And I think there's strength in numbers, in collaboration. I think the more we work together and also as a society and as a community too, mainly as a community, because if we don't do it, uh, it may never get done. So as a community together, we can, we should try more to highlight and promote the talent of individuals with disabilities more and more. It's up to us to speak of disability from a pride perspective, from a positive perspective, from an uplifting perspective. And that also will give hope to the younger generation as they grow up so they can feel more that they belong in the in the community, they belong in society, they can do what they put their minds to and continue the fight ag against ableism. Because I think uh, bringing awareness, having these discussions, they are great, but we also have to work together to take action as well. Thank you. Thank you, Manel. I, I just wanna say something real quick. Um, I work at a school and all the kids know I have ADHD and dyslexia because again, that's how I introduce myself. And they just look at me like, wait, what? Why are you an adult introducing yourself that way? Um, because it's okay. And then I, I go like this, I have ADHD, dyslexia, anxiety, and I speak six languages. So they go, there's a disability that they see and they have the idea that I'm, I'm supposed to be whatever it is I'm supposed to be. And then I go, boom, I speak six languages. And they go, how? And it's just, it's not about me, it's about them because a lot of them come to me and go, thank you. Like, I didn't think I could do this, but you're so smart. I said, a disability is not being not smart. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just show more effort just because of that. So I just, it's very important for kiddos. And even if you Google 
information on ADHD or any disability, first thing that pops up is all negative things. It's good to know what the negative things are, but what about the younger generation that is giving it themselves self conversations about negative thoughts that they have because the society views them that way. So thank you for mentioning that. I agree. I agree with that too. And I also, what I would like to see in so far as law enforcement, as, as you mentioned, not just the education and the advocacy, but it would speak volumes if they would actually hire police officers with disabilities. Because for people in the community, when they actually see that, it goes a long way. Representation matters. And especially for a lot of people on this spectrum where their interaction with law enforcement 99% of the times is negative due to the fact that they don't understand how to communicate with them. So if they open up these opportunities, not only to see it in action, but to have community involvement and outreach so they would get to know us as well as we would get to know them, that would go a long way as well. You know, when I, when I think of law enforcement and even not just on the, let's say, street level, if you will, but even like the Justice Department, what always interests me is when the law is able to exercise restraint. And it's almost like they know what to do and they, they do it with certain people. They do act, they do it at de escalation. They do, for instance, dot their, dot their I's and cross their T's before they bring a case against someone. I mean, you think about, you know, what Merrick Garland's doing, and it's like he's going out of his way to be fair to the point where it's like, you haven't arrested anyone yet? Really? <laughs> so, so, but it's, it's, but this level of restraint is something that the law enforcement is able to do. It's just when it comes to disabled people and people of color, they don't, they're not able to do it all of a sudden. All of a sudden, it's like they're reactive. They're fear for their lives. They shoot first ask questions later. So, I mean, it is, it's a, I guess they call it a cultural problem. I've heard a lot, you know, that expression used with law enforcement because it is interesting when, like for instance, if you think about all, this, all the mass shooters who actually get arrested, don't wind up in body bags and usually they're white. And yet they, they have a gun, usually a very powerful gun and they're spraying it around and yet they somehow wind up they still alive? I mean, how is that possible? Obviously, the cops are able to exercise some restraint. It's just interesting when they don't. We have a, a question from Karen, um, which I just had it now. I'm going to find her again. What aspects of who we each are as people, how could they be, should they be celebrated? by others. Um, for example, I have ADHD. I live with depression. Um, it's great that I can talk about it, be free with it. Plum, I love your statement about how <laughs> everything, and I speak six languages. Um, what are ways in which um, others might be able to celebrate who we are as individuals? Not as a collective, but as individuals. Can I, can I just say something to that, Bill? Hi, Karen, it's Laurie. Um, I, I really like this um, fellow. His name is Parker Palmer. And he has a conversation in this one particular YouTube um, video that I've watched dozens of times with um, Valerie Kerr, K-U-I-R. And she addresses this question specifically. And she said, wonder wonder about people and say to yourself, I wonder what their um, food from their culture is like. I wonder what um, faith-based um, practices they have. I wonder what their genealogy looks like. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And she has this saying that she says, you're not responsible for your um, immediate, from the lamictal you know, area of your brain, your first response, but you are responsible for the second one. 
so you should always be saying, I wonder in a way in which um, we can be amazed by anyone and everyone if you just wonder. If we just observe children before they can speak, that's our role models. They're not worried about anybody. They're not about, worried about judgment. They're not worried about anything. They just are. We're over here, adults, telling them, to, trying to teach them how to be when they're really teaching us how we are, we should be. Just they don't lose their sense of wonder until we take it away from them. So let's look at our child, let's look at our children and just learn from them instead of thinking we're teaching them because they really are teaching us. In terms of celebrating individuals for their differences, I, I guess I mean, we can celebrate the fact that as an individual that they have a different they have a different way of seeing the world. Mm. And then maybe they've developed a certain degree of resilience. They have, might be able to see things that we can't, you know, because uh, you know, they they're they're seeing the world from a different vantage point and that can be valuable. And every individual has that. I think that that is I a agree. Way I agree. To end this dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, Rania, do you want to uh, close things out? I want to thank Mass Families. I want to thank the ARC and the DD Council. I want to give a big thank you to our moderators and our panelists. And of course, I want to thank everyone who has stayed with us. Um, we were at capacity today. So this is how amazing you are. We had a hundred people. We had we we weren't expecting more than that. So some people couldn't even get in. So that's how great you are today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody.